Good morning, Cross Views. Shar Sewell here. And Tim Sewell here, too. And we're just saying hello to you through this uh, wonderful way to still meet as a church, as we have been doing in this digital format. Today, we are so excited to be going into the Psalms with Pastor Kyle as we learn from the wisdom of those words from our ancient times. And we're also going to be reminded in worship today that those ancient words have inspired our songs of praise today and not just in times gone by. So we're going to start with a little reminder of the importance of God's Word from Psalm 119. And we're also going to sing about the life-giving act of praise as we look at Psalm 95. After the sermon, we're going to have a time of reflection. And we're going to go to Psalm 42 for that song and just sing about our hunger and our thirst for the Lord. And then we'll end our time in worship with a song that harkens back to Psalm 18, that no matter what the enemy throws our way, as long as we're calling upon the name of the Lord and praising him in all things, that we will always be solid on our foundation. So we look forward to being in worship today with you, Crossview. And uh, thanks for being here. We love you guys. Blessed is the man who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. But the man who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on his law day and night, he is like a tree planted by streams of water 
which yield its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, prospers. Well, good morning, Crossview family. Welcome this morning. We are looking forward to starting a new series together today. We're going to be starting a new series that's all based on the book of Psalms, and we're calling it Summer Psalms. Our whole goal for today is to fall in love with the book of Psalms and to begin to understand the larger meaning uh, and message of the entire book. The book of Psalms, as many of you probably know, has been an incredibly important and very practical book of worship and prayer throughout the history of the church. It's a very relatable section of scripture, and we can all find ourselves within its words, its cries for help, and its promises and comforts. The book of Psalms works in that it can touch us deeply and in a very authentic and human way as we watch its authors struggle and suffer and celebrate, but it's also significant in that our human experiences are reflected in the Psalms in the context of God's ability to come through on his promises for our good and our salvation. So I want to encourage you today that as we spend the next seven weeks in the book of Psalms, uh, to make it part of your daily routine, to read through, pray through, meditate on these Psalms, and, uh, and that's going to be a good thing. So let's jump into our, our focus for this morning. We're going to start by asking, what is the book of Psalms? It must be important, right? It's smack dab in the middle of our Bible, and we often see the Psalms um, combined in things like packages with the New Testament, like what the Gideons give out. We use them in the church as a call to worship or weave throughout our singing together. There have been many worship songs that have been written from the book of Psalms, and on and on it goes. So what is the book of Psalms? Well, the book of Psalms is an ancient collection of prayers and poems and songs that are written from all different periods of Israel's history, and they have historically paid, played a primary role in the spiritual life of the people of God. Many of these poems came uh, to be used by choirs that sang in Israel's temple, but the book of Psalms came about at some point after Israel's exile to Babylon, where these ancient poems were gathered together and intentionally arranged into the book of Psalms. In fact, the book of Psalms became a hymn book that Jesus and his first followers would have known growing up and they would have been familiar with and would have held in their heart. Jesus and his contemporaries would have known the book of Psalms inside and out, maybe like singing the Beatles for us, but with much more spiritual importance. The book of Psalms are enormously important to the authors of the New Testament as well. Jesus himself quoted and referred to the book of Psalms in a manner of someone who had been accustomed to praying and praying those and pondering them from his very earliest days. The Apostle Paul referred to several psalms and wove them into a in a sophisticated way into his remarkable theology. So the psalms were part of the scripture that Jesus and his followers would have used on a regular basis. So if you don't mind, I'm going to put on my teaching hat this morning as we introduce this series because it's important for us to realize that the book of Psalms uh, it actually has an organizing principle that works to communicate um, something as an entire book. The book of Psalms uh, actually has a very unique design and a message that's important for us to recognize. We have a tendency to see and use the Psalms as a collection of individual poems, prayers, and songs. And they are that. That's not a bad thing. But there's more to it, and it's really helpful for us to know that. So let's get into it. Let me give you an example by looking at the very first Psalm. Psalm 1 is going to be our focus today. So let's read the whole thing together. It's only six verses long. So Psalm 1, 1 through 6. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do, but not the wicked. They are like worthless chaff, scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment." 
Sinners will have no place among the godly, for the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. So the very first psalm is a wonderful example of something that can have great meaning all on its own, but there's also a lot more to it. At the beginning of the psalm, we see a path with two different directions. One direction goes down um, what the psalm calls the road of wickedness. And the other path is a path that's focused on God and his ways and is referred to as the path of righteousness. And it's referred to that throughout the rest of the Bible as well. So as we start to look at this psalm, we notice right away that as an individual psalm, it has a lot to say to us. And it starts with this statement on wickedness. One thing that we know from experience, but also from other parts of scripture, is that wickedness can be tempting and alluring. It can often uh, be self-serving. It puts our own desires first, above other people and even that of God. And at times this temptation toward wickedness seems innocent enough. But if you let that wickedness go unaddressed, it leads to a deeper level of destruction as you give in to temptation and sin to greater degrees. If left unchecked, that temptation and sin can consume your heart and mind. And the outcome, as we see from this psalm, is not great. The path leading to wickedness is a slippery slope, which we are cautioned against. But the the path of wickedness in Psalm 1 is compared with those who choose a different path. Those who, what does it say? Delight in the law of the Lord or the word of the Lord, as it says in some other translations. Did you notice uh, what word it uses there? It uses the word delight. This is such a great word. Here's a fun fact for you. Did you know that the scripture tells us to delight in God's word more than it tells us to study it? Now, studying is good, and it's what we're doing this morning. We should study God's word, but we should also delight in what it says and who it reveals because it points to the hope that we have in Jesus, a hope that we can get nowhere else. So this word delight means to desire deeply. It's used as a way to describe something that is precious, that should be valued. It's it's like a costly jewel or a treasure. It's a word that describes joy and something that is pleasing and completely satisfying. That's what it says, Psalm 1 says for us to do with God's way and God's word. Pretty amazing. On this path, if you let the word of the Lord consume you, if you delight in it, if you meditate on the promises of God and try doing life his way, where does it lead you? Well, it leads you down a path that, is, uh, that leads towards life and it leads you to Jesus. In fact, it says you'll be like a tree rooted strong in the ground, full of life, producing fruit or doing what you were always made for. The life you experience won't wither as, as long as you're planted and healthy, you'll prosper. You'll be able to weather the storms of life. And as we see throughout the Psalms and the rest of Scripture, there are major storms in life that we face. But being anchored and rooted in God and His Word will lead us down a path of life and godliness as we let God's Word shape our heart uh, and mind. One of the things that we learn from the Psalms is that life doesn't just consist of you and me versus wickedness and temptation. Psalms, in a very human way, introduces its readers to this other character, intricately involved in the details of life, this main player, God Almighty. God's word and God's way is an important part of life assumed by the scripture. We are not on our own as we walk through life. God, through this psalm, is showing us the benefits of choosing his way, the way of the righteous. Now, here's the really amazing thing. If you understand how this psalm fits into the larger book, it brings another level of meaning and insight into Psalm 1. So let's look at that a bit as well. To understand how the book of Psalm is organized uh, and how the first two chapters of Psalms help form a foundation for the rest of the book, it's good to start at the end of the book of Psalms. So in order to help us visualize the book of Psalms, I'm going to put on the screen a diagram. Now this diagram comes from the Bible Project and there's some really good stuff here. It's really helpful for us as we look and understand the book of Psalms. So the book of Psalms concludes with five songs of praise uh, to God, um, that, and each of them begins with the word hallelujah. The word hallelujah is Hebrew, and it is a command to tell a group of people to praise Yah, which is short for the divine name Yahweh. 
So that's a nice arrangement and it clues us in onto how the whole thing ends, a conclusion that works like an exclamation point of praise to the entire book of Psalms. So we are to be people who, because of what we've learned, learned in the other 145 Psalms, uh, we, are, we hear this command to worship God and to do so with thankful and glad hearts, praising God with alleluia. As we look at the middle sections of the book of Psalms, uh, you'll see throughout uh, your book of Psalms headings in five places, books one and two, three, four, and five. Now these divide Psalms into five larger sections. And at the ending of each section, the final poem in each grouping has a very similar ending. The ending of each section reads something like this. May the Lord, the God of Israel, be blessed forever and ever. Amen. So the conclusion of each section and the conclusion of the entire book are endings of praise and blessing to God forever and ever. Pretty great, right? So the book of Psalms has, has this conclusion, this internal organization, and the natural next question for us is to take a look at the beginning of the book for an introduction. And what do we find? We find Psalms 1 and 2. What we find in, is that Psalms 1 and 2 stand apart from the rest and work to introduce the entire book of Psalms. Psalm 1 celebrates how blessed the person is who meditates on God's word and chooses the path of righteousness, prayerfully reads scripture, working to obey it, delight in it, all the things that we've just talked about. The outcome is that we are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit in each season. Our leaves never wither and, and will prosper in all that we do. Now, Psalm 2 is a poetic reflection on God's promise to King David from 2 Samuel chapter 7 that one day a messianic king would come and establish God's kingdom over the world, defeat evil and rebellion among the nations. And you should go read it. It's pretty amazing. Psalm 2 concludes by saying that all of those who take refuge in this king will be blessed. The exact same word used in Psalm 1. Together, these two chapters tell us that the Psalms are designed for two reasons. First, to be an anchoring book of God's people where they can see real and deep, authentic encounters with God as people who meditate in and delight in God's word. They can learn the way of God and learn about the character of God. So this anchoring. And the second reason is that the Psalms call for us to be faithful and obedient to a God who works to keep his promise of this messianic king. So we find that the whole book is about humanity's ability to hope and trust in God here and now and to hope and trust in God looking forward eventually to Jesus. And just in case you are wondering whether or not Psalms actually connects the messianic king to Jesus, Jesus himself actually helps us out with that. In Luke 24, we have this story from the day of Jesus' resurrection. In Luke 24, we find the story of two guys who are walking from Jerusalem to a town seven miles away called Emmaus. And as they were walking along, a stranger came and joined them. Now, having heard and read this story, we know that the person walking with them was Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, but they didn't know that. Now, if you remember, Jesus asked them what was going on, and these two men were astonished that he was not aware of all the things that had just happened over the past few days. So they begin to tell him. They tell him of Mary at the tomb and, and how she had seen angels and returned to the disciples, believing that Jesus had been, had been risen from the dead. Uh, they, they told Jesus, though, that they were still discouraged, and they told him that they had hoped that this one would be the Messiah, but they were troubled that he had been killed. Jesus walked with them, and he began to teach them, it says, going back all the way to Moses, working all the way through the, the prophets and the scriptures regarding the, the Messiah. Now, at this point, they were near the end of their journey, and Jesus in, uh, they, were invi they invited Jesus into their home for some food, and it says that Jesus broke bread and tells us that the eyes of these two men were uh, opened, and they recognized who he was. So they rushed back to the disciples in Jerusalem, and they started to retell their story with Jesus. And with the disciples gathered around listening to the story, it says then that Jesus appeared in their midst, and he greets them in Luke 24, 44 through 47. We read this. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. 
Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. So did you notice that? Did you, did you see it? Jesus just said that in the Psalms we find something about Jesus, about himself. The Psalms teach us a lot. They model for us an honest, authentic approach to prayer. They teach us a lot about the character and the nature of God. And they ultimately point to this future hope that, pe- that people have a coming king, Jesus. And it's really exciting stuff. So for the next few weeks, we're going to dive into the book of Psalms and we're going to see what they teach us. We're going to see that they teach us all kinds of things. We're going to look at the book of Psalms from different parts of all of the different five sections. And, and we're going to explore what this book has for us. So are you ready? Let's do it. I want to encourage you to personally dive into the Psalms over the next seven weeks. Make them part of your daily life. Turn from the temptation to go down paths of destruction and instead meditate in and delight on God's word, knowing that we can trust in God's promise and that he always makes good on his promise. If we do that, we will be like a tree planted by the river with its roots deep, producing fruit that we were always designed for. And the cool thing is, then we'll see that this theme it happens over and over. The theme of, of Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 work as these overarching themes that we'll see throughout the entire book of Psalms and into the rest of the New Testament. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for your message. So thankful for the book of Psalms. And I'm so excited as we dive into studying what this book means for us, what it, uh, how, how it helps us in our faith, how it helps us understand who you are, um, how it helps us understand how to interact with you. There's so many different uh, interactions with you throughout the book of Psalms that are, that are inspiring, uh, that, are, uh, uh, that teach us how we can uh, interact and talk to you, that give us permission maybe to go into some areas where we might be afraid to say some things to you or to open up completely to you. But in the book of Psalms, we see these incredible, authentic interactions that help us know you better. God, these Psalms work as a prayer book and as a worship guide for us. And so I pray that you just speak deeply and powerfully to our heart and minds over these next few weeks as we dive into this book. We give you praise and honor, and we're so thankful for your word in our lives. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Will you join us as we just continue to worship together? The psalmist in Psalm 42 cries out, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire. Joy giver and the 